give a talk. I've given some of this talk before at ETH Denver and ETH Dam. Sorry if you were there and caught some of it and it's repetitive, but we are still in the same fight. And Roman and Alexi still need our help. And so we're going to keep, keep going. I uh, want to start out with a little bit of a historical anecdote. Uh, how many of you guys have read the German military doctrine called Truppenführung? Not a lot of hands. Uh, none, in fact. Uh, it's actually really great. I recommend it for everybody to read. This guy, General Ludwig Beck, wrote it in 1934. Uh, it's, it's pretty fun because the, it starts out in the first line with this statement. The conduct of war is an art depending on free, creative activity, scientifically grounded. It makes the highest demands of the personality. Uh, one of the themes of Truppenführung is uh, it, not only does it go over, you know, how to write reports, how to organize your army, how to think about war, but also talks about how to give orders, and it emphasizes the value of individual creativity of your subordinates and how not to override it by being too specific in your instructions. Uh, and so in some sense, uh, it's when you're giving orders as a German officer, you're supposed to communicate your intent so that uh, your subordinates can then use their creativity to figure out what to do. Uh, so you can think that Truppenführung is the original intent protocol, uh, the German army. Uh, this guy is also famous for trying and failing to assassinate Hitler. Uh, sometimes when society is not going in the direction that you think it should, some people who love their country and love their culture rise up and take matters into their own hands and we should think about that. Why privacy? Privacy is normal, you freaks. Uh, full surveillance CBDCs are coming, they're going to monitor everything, they're going to expire your money and say you can't spend it on abortions and whatever. Uh, and governments abuse their power all the time. This is a quote, uh, Zuko brought this up on Bankless, but it's true, Ta talked about this in Amsterdam. Uh, the Dutch had the highest casualty rates during the Holocaust because they were really great at KYC. Uh, and so the Nazis, when they took over all the Dutch uh, systems, they were able to find and hunt down all the Jews because of the KYC, so they were, they were thrilled. The lesson here is that you should design your systems to not only be you know, robust when you're the good guy and you're operating it, but you don't know if the next guy who's gonna inherit it from you is also gonna be the good guy. And so you should design it to withstand that. A Little bit of background about Tornado Cash. It's a privacy protocol used to generate fresh wallets. Why? Because we were jealous of the Zcash private money stuff. We didn't want to reveal our whole transaction history every time we made a payment. Uh, Moloch DAO funded the development. It was an open source privacy protocol to protect the security of ETH users. It's the second snark deployment in human history. There's a thousand person plus trusted setup ceremony. It's a really fun on Twitter. Everybody was sharing their trusted setup. Uh, the Tornado Cash team uh, Rage built the DAP after being rejected from a Moloch DAO grant. They were the finalist with another team, and then we went with the other team, and they were so pissed off, they just shipped the whole thing three weeks. And then we gave them follow-on grants for their uh, additional work, as well as a retroactive grant for the work they did. And we used it for our personal privacy. Uh, I used it for payroll. Vitalik used it to be a hero, uh, send money to Ukraine. Everything was going fine until North Korea store, stole $600 million from a video game. I don't know why a video game had $600 million. <laughs> <laughs> they started pushing some of the proceeds of these hacks into Tornado, hundreds of millions, uh, and then OFAC got mad and sanctioned the contracts. Uh, this is the first ever program that was considered a terrorist. Uh, there's Dutch legal action against Alexei Pertsev started two days after the sanctions, uh, August 10th, 2022. He was held without bail for nine months. He was re finally released, and then he was charged with laundering 500,000 ETH, uh, charges he denied, but he was found guilty in court for 64 months minus the nine months of time served. Some notes from the verdict against Alexei. They acknowledge that he couldn't have stopped anything. Uh, due to the nature of how the works, uh, it's virtually impossible to make it user, user ex interface inaccessible. Uh, smart contracts, you know, nobody can take it offline. It's going to outlive me, 
all of us. <clears throat> they also acknowledged that Alexei didn't have any power over the funds. Uh, they ignored that. They said it doesn't matter. They were providing the service anyway, and money laundering charges don't require you to actually hold custody of the money that you're allegedly laundering. <clears throat> and they claim they should have known better. Uh, they said it was foreseeable from the beginning that the ether derived from a crime would be deposited into Tornado Cash due to the concealment effect. <clears throat> and so this is another quote. They said, Tornado Cash functions in a way the defendant and his co-founders uh, developed it. The operation is their responsibility. If the defendant had wanted to have the possibility to take action against abuse, then he should have built it in. But he did not. The tornado cash does not pose any barrier for pe people with criminal assets who want to launder them. This is why the court regards the defendant guilty. Uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this sucks. Uh, everybody else also agrees this sucks. Um, Lawrence is mad, Lefteris is mad. Uh, and the reason this sucks is because like, there's legitimate reasons to not have admin keys, like security risks for all the legitimate users. If you lose the admin key, then everybody is harmed, uh, including all of the legitimate users. And so I was there when we made that decision to have it be a permissionless, uh, you know, no admin system. Uh, wasn't just those guys. And this is Taylor, it's saying it's insane. They, they, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I'll just keep going. The, this is you know, some support that Alexi got, which I'm really happy about in uh, Amsterdam. They held a little rally to uh, talk about freeing him. Slogans say, you know, open source is not a crime, privacy is not a crime. Uh, would you arrest a gun maker for facilitating a public shooting? Maybe not the best argument, <laughs> but uh, it makes the point that there is some separation of liability. The person who actually buys the gun and does the crime is responsible for the crime not the person who built the tools for ostensibly self-defense. Uh, I just had to throw this in there. You can, you, actual terrorists get less time uh, than Alexei. This is like two and a half, three years for women who are helping the Islamic State, like ISIS. Makes no sense. <coughs> uh, so right now, Alexei is negotiating a bail amount. He's submitted an appeal to a higher court, and pending his successful appeal, the defense will argue Alexei's case again. This will be a couple weeks, maybe months. Switching to Roman Storm, a year after Alexei's arrest, uh, August 23rd, Roman was arrested at home uh, at gunpoint in front of his daughter. The FBI director in the indictment against Roman said, today's announcement should remind criminal organizations everywhere in the world that they are neither untraceable nor anonymous. You can't hide from us behind a keyboard. Whether you're a hacker or a facilitator, which is the dumbest shit, because Roman wasn't even hiding. He was cooperating with the investigation. They knew where he was. I could have just called him, and like, hello, come to the office. Yeah. Uh, and all the code was on GitHub, and all the updates were posted on Twitter. So if you didn't like it, why didn't you send us a pull request? <laughs> I stole that joke from Eric Voorhees. I'm glad you guys are clapping, though. <laughs> Legal action against Roman Storm. He's charged with uh, conspiracy to commit money laundering, conspiracy to violate US sanctions, uh, conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money transmitter, uh, 45 years total, released on bail, pled not guilty. His trial starts September 23rd in New York City. I plan to be there. Uh, there is one white pill, uh, a, you know, a, a positive potential outcome here, which is uh, what Peter's talking about, is that the US and Netherlands laws are somewhat different. Uh, and so there might be uh, you know, a reality where not all of the uh, arguments that were made successfully in the Netherlands court are allowed, like, applied directly to Roman's case, which we're optimistic for. Um, and in this legal fight, uh, we have some support. And so I want to talk about three amicus briefs that were filed uh, on behalf of uh, Romans uh, and the Tornado Cash devs against uh, the Department of Justice. This one by Coin Center. They, they basically split up the three different charges. Uh, this one goes after the sanctions violations and says that um, they, you know, they, they were just open source devs. They didn't 
uh, commit the crimes that were violating sanctions. Blockchain Association, these are all lobbying groups in DC. Uh, hopefully I'm not boring you too much with American uh, legalese, but um, another one is the Blockchain Association, uh, and they went after the money transmitter charge, uh, and they said that um, they don't think that uh, the facts uh, make it so that you know, they, they were operating an unlicensed money transmitter. Uh, they had no control over the funds. So FinCEN, the uh, financial regulator in America, says you know, they have this clause that says accept and transmit, uh, which implies that you have control over the funds that you are actually moving, and that's what qualifies you to be a money services business. And they say that you know, the Tornado Cash devs at no point had any custody over any of the money. It was a non-custodial system. We also have the DeFi Education Fund, uh, which came out and they were targeting the money laundering charges because they were saying, look, these, uh, the devs are not the actual ones doing the crime. There's other people doing the money laundering. If it's, uh, if, 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 it, if it's the case that devs can deploy code and other people do crimes later, then like, the scope of liability for everybody blows up and this is not the kind of way we want to manage our society. Uh, the Empire does strike back occasionally though. Uh, the Department of Justice response to the motion to dismiss uh, was published a month ago, and they said similar arguments to the prosecution in the Netherlands, where they said things like Tornado Cash founders took no action to prevent the Lazarus group of you know, continued use of Tornado Cash, uh, which they knew was ongoing. And also, they completely ignored FinCEN's guidance uh, about the accept and transmit part of the uh, qualification to be a money services business. And they just said, you're money laundering uh, and you're unlicensed money transmitters. So there is a legal uh, defense fundraiser. Did I skip a slide? No. Uh, there's a legal uh, defense fundraiser here. And I, I want to thank the people who have supported it so far. Uh, Edward Snowden for promoting it, uh, as well as a lot of uh, big names who have come out and, and offered ETH. Uh, the Alchemix DAO just donated 15 ETH, so thank you, Alchemix. <coughs> the, some of the rest of this is talking about why they deserve our support, some of our arguments. Uh, the first one is that they made a compliance tool. The compliance tool allowed users to generate a proof of which deposit belonged to them, which allows you to dox yourself to a financial authority. Uh, the Federal Reserve wrote a great report about Tornado Cash. They, promote the compliance tool. Uh, they say to regulate Tornado effectively, users should have to provide receipts to a financial intermediary. You know, it basically says you have to dox yourself to some bank or financial institution in order to have on-chain privacy, which is their sort of compromise. They're essentially mandating the use of the compliance tool that the Tornado Cash team built themselves. And <clears throat> I will nitpick uh, that we are all wrong to call Tornado Cash a mixer, because if it was really a mixer, then you couldn't prove which funds were yours. Crazy idea. Uh, and also, if OFAC had a problem with the compliance tool, they could have just talked about it. Uh, and, and I tweeted this, and, and this is to, to explain the difference between what we were trying to accomplish with our regulatory suggestions and where we ended up. The Dutch prosecutors called the compliance tool bullshit in court. They, <laughs> they said uh, it doesn't matter, it, you know, it, it's not like the, it was meant, you know, uh, forced upon the users. Uh, the Tornado Cash team didn't like make everybody dox themselves. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it was easy to circumvent and therefore it's bullshit. <clears throat> So another argument is that the devs couldn't have stopped anything. This is one that the Netherlands uh, judges accepted. Uh, in, in, in the US indictment against Roman, they, they talked about how they knowingly allowed you know, North Korea to uh, launder money. Uh, they said they operated Tornado Cash as a safe haven. This is the chart of the Tornado Cash ETH. You can see that in the month after, uh, it's the second peak is when it got sanctioned, uh, it dropped a lot from like 250,000 ETH to like 100,000 ETH, but then it went up again. <clears throat> so uh, the amount of ETH went up about 40% after the initial sanctions, and this is despite sanctions, devs arrested, DAO hacked by a malicious uh, governance proposal, the UI being compromised by the DAO hacker, 
Um, it's, it still works. Uh, if, it, if, if, if these guys were operating it, how does it still work? <coughs> Unclear. Uh, the smart contract is immutable. It will continue to operate as programmed until the heat death of the universe uh, or the end of the Ethereum blockchain, whichever one comes first. <laughs> Not even the Torn governance could turn it off. This is a, one of the lead writers at Wired explaining this point. He's like, it's remarkable how successfully the Tornado Cache built something they don't control because it just still works. $283 million flowed into it in March. Um, there was no admin key because this would be a security vulnerability. What if it was hacked? All the money would get drained. The smart contract can be accessed from any UI or CLI. Uh, the UI attempted to you know, block the addresses from the Chainalysis Sanctions API. And so you know, we, don't, we don't think these guys are the criminals who the governments are looking for. Uh, further, the action against Roman and Alexei is a disproportionate misapplication of the law. This is a meme that we made uh, about you know, how the banks get treated by the regulators and how we do. <clears throat> so the cartels straight up laundered practically a billion dollars in fiat through HSBC, who can do things to stop that money from going through them. No one went to jail, nothing was sanctioned. There was a civil enforcement action by OFAC there was a deferred prosecution ag agreement with fines by the Department of Justice, Justice, which just means nobody went to jail, just fines. Uh, with Tornado, OFAC went straight for sanctions. The Department of Justice and the financial regulators in the Netherlands went straight for criminal indictment. Uh, so they requested the five-year uh, role in prison. Um, and this is despite all of the guidance that said, you know, they weren't money services business and stuff. The Tornado uh, cash devs are fighting for all of us. The outcomes of these trials will have far-reaching consequences for ETH devs and users, especially those working on privacy tools. If they lose, they face imprisonment, and government overreach holding protocol developers responsible for the crimes of users will reach only further. Uh, today, Alexei woke up in a cell. Tomorrow, he will also wake up in a cell until we negotiate his bail, bail and then, you know, if, if he loses, he'll wake up in a cell for four or five more years. Uh, I want to give thanks to NounsDAO, Brennan.eth, they wrote this manifesto. Um, we find ourselves as a, at a pivotal juncture in history where our actions and decisions will significantly influence the landscape of commerce and freedom. Across our global village, voices rise in unison, advocating for the liberty to engage in commerce, for the autonomy to innovate without undue hindrance, for the sovereignty to partake in the vast tapestry of global trade. These are not mere theoretical concepts. They are the bedrock upon which we construct our shared economic future. Let us be clear, our resistance is not born out of a disregard for governance or societal welfare. Instead, it is rooted in the belief that true economic prosperity flourishes in an environment of freedom and open competition. Our struggle is not against regulation per se, but against the overreach that stifles innovation, creativity, and equitable access to markets. Thus, let us advance with determination, not as adversaries of regulation, but as advocates for balanced and reasonable frameworks that nurture innovation and equitable commerce. Let our resistance be a testament to our commitment to economic freedom, a beacon for open trade, and a clarion call for the empowerment of all participants in the global market. Uh, we turn that manifesto into NFTs. Uh, please buy them. Uh, on the, you can follow at Free Alexi Roman uh, and find those. Also, going to talk about privacy pools a little bit. Uh, we are advancing the compliance tools that the Tornado Cash team pioneered, uh, and it allows users to publicly dissociate from illicit funds in a way that they couldn't before using the version one of the compliance tool, where they could only public, you know, uh, privately dox themselves uh, because it only proved your specific deposit. This, in our view, aligns with the regulatory objective of isolating the illicit funds while still providing privacy for legitimate users. And I think uh, it's, it's important that we advance this narrative um, because the narrative that they're coming at us with, uh, one that the court in the Netherlands uh, repeated, was there is no legitimate use for tornado cash for any of it. Uh, and I think we, it's, it's on a, us to try and 
shift that and show that we can build tools for everyday users to have privacy and benefit from it without uh, you know, empowering criminals and terrorists. Uh, this is how this works. You basically prove that you're not some subset of the deposits. Um, <coughs> membership proofs is I am in this group. Exclusion is I'm not those guys. So you, you can see the money that comes in from DeFi hackers and stuff like that, and you can prove that you're not those deposits. Uh, we shipped a working demo last ETH Denver, published a paper with Vitalik about privacy pools and compliance. We presented this in Basel with Dr. Fabian Schar, the author of the original Tornado Cash paper about the compliance uh, recommendation there. Uh, Malik Dow gave grants the chain way to build it. Uh, we got our first audit report back, it had some bugs, so we went back and forth, and uh, now we're getting it re-audited. I think it'll ship this month. I've been saying that for like three months, but this is really the month. Uh, I'm now advising Oxbow a company doing compliance uh, monitoring and whitelisting for privacy pools and more. Um, this is sort of more about how it works. Uh, you just, you know, use a similar privacy tech and then you just submit uh, two proofs instead of one proof. In, in addition to saying I have coins that have not been spent, I also say I'm also part of this whitelist. Uh, here's the Merkle root of the whole list uh, that I'm proving against so that anybody can verify the list that I'm proving. And in practice, it allows you to, you know, by process of elimination, uh, keep the people that you don't want to associate with out of your anonymity set. So you're not associating with the people who can't prove that they're on the whitelist. They're not associating with you. <clears throat> this is uh, an oxbow lake being formed. That's why it's called oxbow. Uh, it's when a have a river and it bends and then part of the bend breaks off and it becomes its own isolated liquidity. Uh, here's just a rough schematic of how it's gonna work. Um, the important thing here is that uh, our, it, it, this, the system allows the relayers to prove that they're not mm, processing any transactions for the, the criminal users if there are any that we identify. Uh, and so that way we can keep everything separate. Um, this is some UI teaser. We're planning on launching the beta soon, so please come test it out and see if you make it onto our whitelist. Uh, <laughs> that's part of the game. Uh, we're hiring to help bring compliant privacy to your everyday Ethereum users. We need UI devs and smart contract devs to help. Please follow us at Oxbow.io, zero expo. Uh, <clears throat> and in conclusion, uh, Putting the devs in eternity for and feeding their guts to the eagles won't help put out the zero knowledge proof fire. Uh, the future that we want depends on zero knowledge proofs for privacy. We want freedom versus CBDCs that are gonna take over our lives. We want blockchain democracy. We wanna be able to vote on things without revealing information about ourselves, how we voted. Uh, these are important, uh, that's why we're here. And so uh, in the story of Prometheus, uh, who, you know, steals the fire from the gods, uh, gets chained up and has his e eagles eating his guts. Uh, Hercules is the one who lets him free. So together we can all be Hercules and try to keep our friends out of prison. <clears throat> Please follow the free Alexi Roman Twitter and consider donating if you can. Thank you. Awesome presentation, I mean, and um, also thank you just for your continued education in the ecosystem, um, helping people on board uh, and just gain awareness of these tools and this knowledge. Knowing that uh, the Tornado co Cash contracts are immutable, what do you think the motivation behind the sanctions are? Is it to invoke some kind of fear to get builders to stop building technology with privacy in it? Um, is it to send a message? Uh, it just seems strange that um, knowing some basic facts that you would go ahead and sanction contracts. Um, I like to think that there's another reality in which North Korea wasn't hacking video games for $600 million uh, and you know, escalating the situation where maybe the right regulations could have possibly passed and people could have used the you know, compliance tool to prove 
who they were to some bank or something, and then that would have been okay. Uh, I think that the knee-jerk response to this was just ban it, and the way that they were able to ban it was sanction the contracts. Um, I'm optimistic that we can use immutable permissionless systems, but there's no guarantee. Uh, and so if the standing, you know, if the opinion of the court in the Netherlands, which is that it, you should have known that somebody could use it for crime, and so you should have backdoored it in a way that you could have, you know, managed the abuse, uh, is allowed to, I don't know, uh, becomes law in America as well, that's not good. Uh, then that's, as far as I understand, uh, the end of permissionless immutable <laughs> systems. So I think we should all try to do what we can to uh, protect those and, and to make the case for, for them as neutral infrastructure uh, that benefits everybody that um, we can use without giving much value to people who might use them for uh, criminal activity as well. We have, we have another one back here. Um, I keep c coming back to the court opinion in Netherlands. It just seems outrageous to me, uh, the express uh, opinion. D does, do, do you think that the judges do not understand how open source software works or how decentralization works? Or is it an intentional overlooking? I don't know. It just seems really at odds. It's kind of like trying to say, hey, I'm going to sanction you, punish you, because of freedom. you had a freedom of thought and freedom to express that thought in code. And that's like goes against basic tenets of democracy. Or am I missing something in Netherlands laws? Well, if the thought could have been used for crime, uh, then maybe you shouldn't have thought it. Yeah, but that's... I'm, I'm joking, but uh, the <clears throat> I, I am as frustrated and, and uh, annoyed about it as you are. I had slides in here about my reaction to their uh, basically saying this, that, you know, uh, should have known and, and uh, can't, can't put, put it out there. Um, they, I, I thought it was willful ignorance uh, at first, but... In their own verdict, they acknowledge the immutability of it. And then they, they, instead of being like, oh, okay, maybe we've got the wrong guy, they were like, he shouldn't have done it at all, uh, which is just way worse uh, for all of us uh, in, in terms of you know, the values that we like to promote in terms of permissionlessness, censorship resistance, right? I can very easily imagine an argument by a government saying, why did you make it so censorship resistant? Didn't you know that we're trying to censor the criminals here? Why are you making our job harder? Uh, we're going to put you in prison because you should have known that by trying to make this thing censorship resistant, uh, you were going to help criminals. Uh, and that's a very dangerous argument that we should take very seriously. I just wanted to ask how, uh, how quick can Oxbow identify uh, a malicious actor and how quickly can you uh, integrate that address uh, into, into your allow list? Yeah, the question is how fast can Oxbow identify malicious actors? And some of it's more obvious, some of it's not. You know, if you come from a DeFi protocol with $100 million, we might be like, uh, where'd you get it? <laughs> you know, uh, but <clears throat> uh, our, our standard will probably be around three days. Uh, we'll try and do faster in some cases. Uh, if the money comes from Coinbase, it'll probably go in faster. If it comes from, uh, you know, sources that require more wallet analysis, then that might take a bit longer. Um, so it's sort of our judgment, but we'll try to keep it within about three, seven days. And usually, when people deposit into these things, they don't withdraw right away. Anyway, they with they deposit and leave the money there for some time, and then later withdraw after the association set has been built up. So, um, in the version that we have built so far, uh, it's a permissionless system that is non-custodial, and so users who don't get on the whitelist uh, will still be able to uh, remove their funds from the protocol. Um, they 
might be interested in self-doxing on the way out if they are themselves not interested or, or would prefer not to be associated with the other people who didn't make it onto the whitelist. <laughs> okay, we're at time. Thanks so much for everybody. Thanks so much for your talk.